Let's get into it. Soul Not For Sale podcast, Coach Colin here. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven clips for you guys today. We're starting with Joe Rogan. And Joe Rogan, I'm telling you guys, if you know where he's at, send him a mega hat. You see him in public. Just if you have one on, just throw it to him because he needs one. Because he's going on a rant about how terrible he thinks Joe Biden is. I mean, literally, his words in this clip, he should not be in the position he's in. I'm it's a wi wild rant he goes on. But he also talks about Gavin Newsom a little bit. So, and some choice words for him as well. So we're going to be jumping off of the Joe, uh, Joe Rogan clip, and we're going to be jumping into Bill Maher talking delusionally about Gavin Newsom and how he should be president. And Bill Maher's guest actually puts him in check. My opinion, they go back and forth. I think his guest puts him in check really well. Then we got Stephen A. Smith completely has awoken. I know he's deep into the Hollywood sphere of things, but he is completely awoken. He's calling out Joe Biden as well. Then we got Trump, of course, calling out Joe Biden on his cognitive decline. But Trump is taking a more compassionate uh, a role in this one. Very odd, but you know, you got to hear it. Then we have uh, Biden and Trump visiting the border together, not not in the same places. Biden's at Brownsville. Trump is at Eagle Pass going to be playing you Trump's speech at Eagle Pass, Biden's speech at Brownsville. And we're just going to be breaking down that whole thing. And then Trump's victory speech because he just just one Missouri. Let's get into it right now. Don't forget about I am coach .com. We got soul not for sale. Bunch of different variants of that. Then we got public enemy number one, anti mainstream, we the people stuff, presidential mug shots, certified pure blood stuff. Discount code is I am coach Colin, all capital letters, all one word, one L in the name Colin. Let's start off with Rogan. Someone of such esteem as our incumbent president okay. of the United States with a record of accomplishments and a man of character, a man of decency. I'm old school. Talk about loyalty. I'll, I'll go to ends of the earth for this guy. Bro, I really would. I wouldn't, Ooh, I wouldn't hire him for one of them fucking cop shows. One of them goofy TV cop shows. I'd be like, bro, you can't. This is like, you're too over the top. No one thinks a politician talks like that. Yeah. It's crazy. You no, know? it's so <laughs> phony. And the thing is, in his case, um, this is what I would say. He just looks like he's lying. This is what I would say. If I am the vice president of a company and I know that the president is stepping down and then they have, do you, do you, would you want to take over the position? Like, let me tell you how great that guy is. He is the best ever. He's the best ever. I could not fill his shoes. I know I'm filling his shoes. Right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm throwing the guy a bone. I'm being nice because I'm not in competition with that guy. Whereas any other time, a politician would be at least angling for the position that they are the superior choice. They'd be saying... Although I fully support the Biden administration, we disagree on, I think, my vision is that we move forward in this direction, and this is why I think that's going to be beneficial, and I would love to convince them that I'm correct, but I'm positioning myself as a superior choice to what's, obviously, the guy wants to be president. Look at him. He, look, he looks like a president. He wants to be president. But, bro, you, <laughs> fucking, you gotta talk to some regular people. That's not how you could say it. You could say all the things you just said. I think he's a man of decency, and I think he's a man of character. You can say it like that. Right. A man of decency, a man of care. I'm old school. <laughs> well, <laughs> you even, are old school. You're acting like you're in a 1950s movie. You're in a fucking James Cagney movie. This is crazy. He even alludes to uh, his loyalty, which is obviously, I mean, I wouldn't yeah. call it loyalty, but. Uh, like, bro, you got to clean up California first, sir. You got work to do. Oh you got to do something about California. You can't just let LA be the way it is. I know, I know you're limited in what you can do and what you can't do. God damn, you got to move forward and fix that. Fix that, and then maybe we'll talk. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> He's clearly <laughs> lying, and y you're right. We know why he's lying. There's some sort of behind-the-scenes thing. That's your guy. Right. He, That's your guy. He's your guy. Um, but what do we do with all of the people who appear, you know, the normal folks who can't see Biden's cognitive decline? That's not real. I don't think that's real. I don't think there's anybody out there. I think they just don't want to talk about it because they feel terrible about the idea that Trump becomes president, which seems to be inevitable. And then you see Kamala Harris serving up word salad like it's a fucking <laughs> buffet at the Golden Corral. I've seen these headlines today. Kamala Harris says she's ready to serve amid Biden mem memory concerns. They Yo, they're going to put her on a fucking convertible, take her through Dallas. <laughs> That's just fuck. Uh, this is, nobody wants that. No, well. Uh, I don't think they want that. Look, nobody wants that. I actually think we have to. 
boy, it got quiet in here. Yeah. Um, here's the problem. Our Constitution anticipates terrible people like Kamala Harris. Right. It does not anticipate a hidden cabal acting through a senile figurehead. Right. So from my perspective, we, are, we have been in a consistent constitutional crisis for the entire Biden administration. His decrepitude was obvious before he was elected. All right. So something else is in control, and that is completely unacceptable in terms of the constitutionality of our system. So the right thing to do is to remove the incompetent person. Either he steps down or he's removed by the 25th Amendment. Kamala Harris has to take office, and I hope she has no power to do anything because I don't trust her. But the point is at least that is a step back in the direction of normalcy, the, of, normalcy of checks and balances. And then if that is the case, that actually would open the door to Newsom because then Newsom would be competing against Kamala Harris, who doesn't have the same respect for her. At least openly. He's not right. talking about her. But if he steps down and Newsom says, it's my obligation. My, I know the right way to this country. Right. The problem is, as a patriot, um, I'm not even sure I can worry about that. Because any day that Joe Biden is in that office and the call might come over the phone, you know, somebody's launched a something. What are you going to do, Mr. President? Right. We can't Start have that. Cream. You have to have an actual person who's capable of responding to a crisis in that office yes. is offensive to the population that we would have had this circus, you know, with an obviously incompetent guy at its head in the office. And I, from my perspective, the right thing to do is he has to, he has to leave the office immediately, right? Any minute that he's there compounds the problem. And the fact that it's Kamala Harris in the vice presidency, well, this is, this is the way nature tells you that you need to pay very careful attention to who people choose as their running mates. Yes. Right? If somebody chooses somebody who's bad, right? If somebody chooses impeachment insurance, right? They're telling you they should not ascend to the office. Right. But we dodged those bullets. We dodged it with Dan Quayle. We dodged it with Mike Pence. Yep. We dodged it with Joe, Joe Biden for eight fucking years. Right. This, you know? Right. We did. And we that was eight years when he could talk. So the that, olden days. Then the answer is Kamala has to take the office. The Congress has to step up and make sure that Kamala does not have the power to do anything that is not reasonable. And we need to understand that the Democratic Party has announced that they are not interested in the consent of the governed, that they are interested in, uh, you know, putting on a show and, you know, kowtowing to people's sensitivities, but they're not interested in actually governing the country in the interest of the citizens. And they're also not interested in pushing anyone who's not going along with the plan, whether it's Tulsi Gabbard whether it's Robert F. Kennedy Jr., anybody that is very popular, it, could you imagine a primary, like a debate between Biden and RFK? Let RFK go. Let him go on TV. Imagine RFK telling the truth about certain issues, RFK explaining how these systems work, RFK saying things where people accuse him. People have accused you of this. What is your answer? Like, let him say that on national television and people go, oh, wait a minute. What is he saying? What's going on here? And then, like, I like that guy better, and he's a Kennedy, right? And, and next, and he's a Democrat, lifelong Democrat, and he's like, he's like a reasonable sort of centrist character. Hold on, that's our guy. That's our guy. And people would fucking vote for him, and they didn't want it. Of course they would. And the fact that they're not begging him to run as a Democrat is proof that they would rather lose to Trump. Well, there's enough boomers that think he's a loon that it becomes a problem. Like you'd have to re-educate people, but that's where the debate would come into play. At least some reasonable people on the fence, and definitely some never Trumpers. The never Trumpers would go in that direction. They would go, look, this guy can win a debate against Trump. Whereas I don't think Joe Biden's even capable of having a debate no. at this point. He can't keep track of what, what he's talking about. He's saying he's talking about people that have been dead for years and mistaking names. He's, he fumbles in the middle of sentences and forgets what he's talking about and says he's being told to wrap it up. And it's like it's embarrassing. And it's not, it's elder abuse also. If that was my dad yep. and they were forcing my dad to do that, I'd be like, come, oh, leave him the fuck alone. He's 80 years old. The guy should be chilling somewhere. He should be relaxing in a zero stress position where he's catching bluegills on a pond or going golfing, whatever the fuck he likes to do. He shouldn't be in that position. It's aging an already aged man. We know it hyper ages people. That fucking stress is brutal to everybody but Trump. <laughs> that dude was like, like water off a duck's back. Just, he didn't seem to age at all. He seems like the fucking same guy. Like he's remarkably durable. But for Biden, it's been horrible. But I think it opens the door for Newsom because I think Newsom, like I think the whole Democratic Party will, will embrace him. And you know, if he could just come closer to the center, 
I think he's got a real shot. Well, uh, I, I hope not. Um, I mean, the guy is utterly despicable. And uh, obviously, California tells you that he's perfectly capable of uh, engaging in terrible governance, uh, you know, to the, to the great detriment of the people uh, under his leadership. So it's a disaster. And if you don't, if you haven't been there, if you, <laughs> when you, when I go back, every time I go back, I'm like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not only am I not exaggerating, I'm underplaying it. The, 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 <laughs> wow. Wow. I wonder, I wonder if Brett's ever going to really tell people how he feels about Gavin Newsom. I don't know, man. He was kind of kind of wishy-washy about what he thought. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that was crazy. He's utterly despicable. <laughs> and you know what? He's not wrong, man. When I see Newsom talk, I'm like, oh, that guy. Oh, that guy. Like, like I, I see him and I think of, I know I compare him to like uh, Justin Trudeau a lot and vice versa. But I see him and I see like a male Hillary Clinton. And I'm like, oh. This is dangerous. This is oddly dangerous. Like you can look in his eyes and be like, "Oh, this guy will do the worst things." I don't even. I don't even know. I don't want to sound like Joe Scarborough on mainstream, on mainstream uh, television talking about Trump and oh, the brown shirts are coming to get you and blah blah blah. But I don't know, man. I see that guy talking. I'm just like, "Oh, that's no, 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 no." That's like your cool dad. You know, your parents get a divorce and then this evil stepdad moves in. And you're like, oh, my God, I got to sleep with this guy around. Are you kidding me? That's what I feel when I see that guy. He's just he's not not good, not good for the country. You know, just as bad as Hillary would be, I think. That's just that's just me. Um, <laughs> let's get into this clip right before I start. Uh, or let's get into what this clip was about before I get into Bill Maher. But I will pull that up in a second. Really quick, uh, such a disrespectful impression of Joe Biden, Joe Rogan had there. You see what he did? Ice cream. So disrespectful. Wow. (laughs) But I mean, that that was that was the that was the uh, flavor of this whole thing. You could see again. It's funny because he said all those things about Biden. And then at the end, he brings up Trump and say, oh, it's like, you know, Trump didn't even age and he's like the same guy and water off a duck's back and it's very like why don't you just say that he's the best guy for the job if here's the thing you're basically saying that everybody gets aged massively from the position and it's detrimental to their health but there's one guy who it didn't age he seems fine and still seems like the exact same guy and did a good job why don't you just come out and say he's the best guy for the job I don't get it. It's it's interesting, but I know I know why because Joe would just get attacked like crazy, and it's like why endure through that just because you want to say it? But at the same time, it's like he's he is just a comedian. He does have a massive platform. You could say you got to do it for America, but does he? He's just a comedian. I would say yes, he should. That would be a good thing to do, but. Yeah, he doesn't have to, I guess. Um, (laughs) Kamala Harris serving up word salad. It's odd that uh, Brett, Brett is so, I don't know, like when you're weighing this out, Biden just in the way he is now, Kamala Harris in. If Biden, here's the thing, he's talking about, you know, if, if God forbid he gets that call and he has to make a decision that's like in regards to war, you don't want him making that decision. Well, do you want Kamala Harris making that decision? Because you're talking about, oh, he, he can't be in that position. Better if Kamala Harris steps in and the Congress just doesn't let her do anything. Well, you already have Biden in. I don't, I don't know which would be worse in that position. I feel, honestly, I feel like Kamala Harris would be worse in that position. I feel like she's just, I think Biden's, I think Biden's doing what he's told because he's old. I think if he was young, I think if he was 40, he would do what he wanted to do. And it probably wouldn't be the best things, but he would do what he wanted to do. I think Kamala Harris will just do whatever she's told. Whatever. They'll, they'll just be like, go and tell them. Tell them it's wartime and to hide under their t- desks. And she'll be like, okay, all right. <laughs> now, the reason that we have desks in our house is for writing. And it's not just for writing, but also for coverage for the bombs. Bye. And you'd be like, oh, well, I guess, 
Okay. I'll just make my will then. Um, <laughs> that's just breaking down that clip. Let's move on. Bill Maher, uh, kind of getting put in his place by the guest that he has on, Jillian Michaels. Let's get into it. Talking about Gavin Newsom. I, uh, okay, let's just play. I've been trying to get Gavin to run for president for a very long uh, time. And Are you serious? Uh, Are we living in Gavin Newsom's California? Why? Yeah, and I'm sure your life is just a I nightmare. I laughed because of him. Oh, right, you're Moved in Florida? to Miami. It's so, you know what? I'll tell you something. Lived here my in whole 2020, life. In 2020, I, I, I've lived here since 83. Okay. And I love where I live. I love California. I lived I in mean, Malibu. I, I'm dug in here. I share your frustrations with California. Okay. I do. And I, that, those are the things I was saying to him. I mean, this is one I think things, I could pretty, I could speak to again, pretty, pretty you, eloquently. But are you happier in Florida? Yeah. What, what, what is it in Florida that's, that's, over that compensated more than what you had here. It feels less crazy than it does here. Here, you just Florida's like, less crazy. Yeah, hear me <laughs> out. Hear me out on this. Really, Here's the place I mean. where the people are the, okay, look, on bath salts, like your fucking girl, an alligator. Sage Steele asked me. She's like, "What was the moment when you felt like California had lost its mind?" And it was a piece of legislation that I, I can't recall. Did it affect your life? But Bill, did it affect your is life? Is the crime affecting our lives? Is, is the homelessness it, is affecting crime, our was lives? Was crime affecting your life? My, here yeah, in California? absolutely. My house got broken into. Your house got broken into. Yes, and guess what? The relationship with PG and E. My house burned down in 2018. Where's your house? I, I lived in Malibu. <laughs> uh, Malibu. Montal, yeah. You got wow. You got broken into in Malibu. I got. <laughs> Things so, are rough out there. No, the, like, our, oh, and it, it was so nuts. I'm voting and guess for who Trump. Let, guess who let the guy out during COVID? Because I got the letter. Newsom. It was the guy's third offense. He broke into our house. He had duct tape and a video camera. Anyway, long story. But he third strike. Guy goes to jail. Gets let out during COVID. I mean, give me a fucking break. You're not going to hold PG&E accountable for that fire in 2018. Yeah. You're going to decriminalize everything but regulate nothing. You're prioritizing the crazy shit I've ever seen in my life. Like, uh, come on. Really? Again, my thing with Gavin is, first of all, he can win. Uh, First of all, I just like him. Uh, I think he's really smart. Mm -hmm. Is he a politician? Yes. That's the... uh, Hello, Paula, is he slick? Good. I'm fucking glad he's slick. Slick people win elections. Clinton was slick. Obama was pretty slick. How do you feel about the way he handled Good. COVID? We have not California for, was the not last for it. state to reopen. Not, not for it. Shut it's, the schools forever. Not, not, not for it. Mind you, with no mask on at the French Laundry after saying oh, that you see, can't. Again, you are just... I think you've been captured by this. No, I haven't. This is he's what, a hypocrite, this is what, and that bothers this, me. The rules were absurd. Okay. You could okay, Bill. I know, but it's Bill, like it's like they were really absurd. You're, you're, you're obsessing I'm not, again though. about what the, was done the, right. You're obsessing about the dandruff. If he was he a went to C-O-O. the wrong restaurant, really, Bill, this is it, he like didn't again. Follow his own rules. Get, if you're going to be I a leader, it. you lead by example. That's not fucking dandruff. If he was the COO of a company, wasn't there like there's a two, ninety this two choices. billion dollar? I can almost guarantee whoever he's going to run against from the Republican Party, although every time I make the decision independently, I must guarantee that I will think he's smarter, better at government, which Republicans don't even take seriously. They don't know how government works. Democrats are at least wonks. They actually know how government works. It's actually very complicated. You have to study it. It's arcane. It takes a lot of people in a lot of rooms at three in the morning with boxes of stale pizza and coffee and making and crafting laws that you'll never read but affect your life, people who actually really get things done. Okay. Is he that kind of person? Yes, I think he is. Holy, I don't, this is, you know what? Because I've had to watch the Bill Maher, uh, you know, a few times. And, and sometimes I watch it by choice. I mean, his conversations are interesting sometimes. And he always finds common ground with the people who disagree with him. It's the second time he's brought up that pizza reference. I don't know what he thinks. It's almost like he thinks in regards like a he's been in Hollywood so long that he brings up the image that you'd see in like a TV show. Like they're just sitting there eating pizza. Like We got to get this done. Like, is that what you think AOC does? Are you crazy? The more I listen to Bill Maher, the more I think, I don't, I don't know. His, his views seem delusional. It just seems delusional at this point. 
the things that he talks about he's been trying to get like put this guy in jail get this guy some cuffs he's been trying to get gavin newsom to run for president for years and here's the thing that means he's friends with gavin newsom that means he's talks with gavin newsom Red flag for both of them. Red flag for Gavin Newsom that he's friends with Bill Maher. Red flag for Bill Maher that he's friends with Gavin Newsom. Completely, like, I mean, that, that in my mind, kind of shows that Bill Maher is very much captured. And funny enough, he calls that woman captured. A woman who's been in the Hollywood eye forever. Really nice woman, by the way. The last time I did a videographer gig and i had to like do a conference i actually had to work with her i had to mic her up and, vid and vid film her and everything she's actually a really really cool person but she's been deep in hollywood forever and then wakes up and says i need to get out of here and she's the one that's captured while bill maher is actually the one who's still in california knows that it's all terrible doesn't care because he's rich and it doesn't affect him knows that gavin newsom is not you could tell by this clip as she's bringing up all these points, he's like, oh, oh, he's just saying, oh, he could win. He could win. All he cares about is his side winning. It's crazy. He knows he knows that this guy is slick. He knows that this guy doesn't follow his own examples. He knows that he sets rules for people and then doesn't follow them. He knows all of this. And he's like, I don't care. He can win. He can win. And I just like him. That's your that's your political stance. That's great. That's great. I don't know what happens to Bill Maher when he doesn't have a, a monologue to read off of. It's just like, it's crazy. It's so crazy. And lastly, before I move on to the next clip, Stephen A. Smith calling out Biden. Lastly, the person that broke into her house, third offense, duct tape in a video camera. What? Whew, man, absolutely wild. Now I'm going to show you what is... Uh, ticking off Stephen A. Smith so much. This is Joe Biden meeting with a black family and doing what you know black people love to do, eat chicken. Well, I mean, you got chicken fingers, you got, you got the whole deal. <laughs> oh, I went the route of making sure I had the hamburger. So tell me about you guys. What you doing these days? Why don't you share about your passion of sports? I'm playing AAU basketball right now. Are you really? You look, are you guard? Yes, sir. Now, what grade are you in? Seventh grade. Seventh grade. Right now, I'm just doing basketball, playing guard on the JV team for my school. How right, about in school? How are y'all doing in school? Why don't you tell the president about the school? Favorite thing about it is the business academy I'm in. You get to like travel, so we've been to like NC State, uh, Wake Tech, and we. You're kidding we, me. Yeah, we went to this small dry cleaning business, and it's just it's cool. It's a great experience. I'm impressed. Is that a new program at the school? Yes, sir, it is. It just started just a couple of years ago. You know how much this guy loves you. Yeah. You can just feel it, can't you? Yes, sir. Your dad jumped in front of a bull for you. By the way, we dads are hard to raise. Once you're a teenager, we're hard to raise. So you got to be patient with us, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. Go patient. <laughs> Wow. Wow. All right. All right. So we're going to move on to Stephen A. Smith. But I will say within that clip, it is so hokey to do the uh, fried chicken thing with a black family and have it filmed like that. Uh, I, I, I hate to see it. I do love chicken, though. I mean, I can. I, I love fried chicken. Um, but it is like, uh, come on, man. I don't know, like, I don't, like, why not take, like, a black family to, like, a restaurant and eat, like, steak or something? I don't know. I don't know. But, I mean, let's, can't lie. I mean, they probably loved it. They probably loved it. I would love it. It's not a racist thing to say. I'm just saying. Um, but we're going to see Stephen A. Smith. But let me just say really quick, in that clip that you just saw, Biden is in exactly what Joe was saying. He's in grandpa mode. If that's your, if that's your grandpa... And he's talking about this stuff. He's great. That's great. Grandpa talking to you about you're in business and this and that. That's fantastic. When he's the president, though. Oh, man. Anyways, guys, let's move on. Stephen A. Smith is about to go off on Biden. And I mean go off. Fried chicken. They made the connection, right? 
Y'all would have a problem with Fox News and Jesse Waters bringing something like that up. I have a problem with the president. There's black kids all over the place. There's a whole bunch of black kids in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. That is the kind of scene, that is the kind of imagery you and your team decided to provide? Really? Really? Sitting down eating fried chicken. Come on, man. Now, on this show, I've called out Trump and various other Republicans for some of the decisions that they made and some of the things that they've done. Do you think I'm going to let President Biden off the hook? This wasn't, Kamala, this wasn't Kamala Harris in Raleigh. This was him. This is the same dude who was a senator in the 90s pushing the crime bill. You know that crime bill that led to mass incarceration for an inordinate amount of black folks that Bill Clinton himself and others in the Democratic Party lamented? Well, who was more of a culprit in that regard than Biden? I recognize what he's done for HBCUs. I recognize what he's done for infrastructure. I recognize what he's done for forgiveness of student loans. I recognize these things. I'm not trying to expel or expunge the good that he has done. But this imagery, I want to know who the hell came up with that idea. Because you know Trump and the GOP are going to use that to their advantage, right? And they'll be right to do so. Because ladies and gentlemen, if we're being fair, if we saw Donald Trump sitting down in a black household eating fried chicken with a father and a son, what would we say? We, what, what would we say? What would we say? You know folks out there would be calling it racist. Well, if it's racist for him, and I'm not saying it would be, but if it's racist for him, why wouldn't it be racist for Biden? I'm not calling the president the R word. I'm not making that accusation. I'm not accusing anybody on the Democratic or the Republican side for feeling that way over such an incident. What I am saying is it is what you projected in the eyes of some people. You've given people that ammunition. And if you could give it to them on the right, what absolves you on the left from doing the same thing? I mean, damn, I should have ran for president. Some of the idiotic ass things that you folks do the level of insensitivity, the lack of understanding. No wonder people are willing to vote for Trump in 2020 or 2016. No wonder they're looking for candidates all over the place. No wonder you lose faith in a political apparatus that exists. Some of the asinine decisions that y'all make with no regard, no understanding, totally oblivious to how it's going to look. You don't think People going to look up Biden's history as a senator before he became president and juxtapose that to the imagery that was just provided. I should have ran. I might have got tens of millions of votes. <laughs> Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith. Rage on demand. He just wakes up angry, ready to go. But... In this case, it's so true. It's so true to call that out, man. That's just like when Hillary Clinton, I don't know if you guys saw it. She was on this show and she's like, one thing I never leave the house without, hot sauce. I always got it in my purse. And it's like, you're Hillary Clinton. You don't carry a purse around. What are you talking about? And there was nothing else inside the purse but hot sauce. You're expecting us to believe that you just walk around with a purse filled with hot sauce? And then the host was like, you're trying to, you're trying to uh, like uh, get the black vote. And then she goes, well, is it working? It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then to the point that he said about Biden as a senator, I don't know how any black person could look up Biden and Kamala Harris and be like, yeah, those are those are my guys. Those are my guys. I, I don't get it. I don't know how you could look up Biden as a senator, Kamala Harris, in, in her past, and then look up Trump in his past and be like, well, Trump's racist and those two are my people. They fight for me. I don't get how you can be black and do that. I don't understand. Obviously, you know, black people are just like anybody. You have your your right to just think freely and thinking now maybe you're willing to let go of whatever happened in the past. You know, that's cool, too. That's a that's a that's a good thing to be able to do. But it's just, I just don't get it. When I when I look at these these three, how you can look and be like those two right there 
those are my people, they're good. And then you look at Trump and be like, oh, he's bad. He's the worst thing. It's very, very interesting. But Stephen A. Smith, man, calling it out the way he sees it. And 100% if we saw Trump do that. Trump gave a speech and said, you know, there's a lot of black people that identify with me because they get unjustly prosecuted and I'm being unjustly prosecuted. And they were like racist. Could you imagine what would happen if he sat down with a black family and was eating chicken fingers? Could you imagine what would happen? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It'd be it'd be terrible. All right. Now we're going to move on. We're going to hear Trump talking about Biden. And <laughs> man, man, Sean Hannity does Biden dirty with this compilation. He does him so dirty with this compilation. Always. He's always bringing out the compilations. I think this is the second time that he's done this. I don't know if it was a Trump or DeSantis, but he keeps bringing out compilations of Biden and his gaffes. So we're going to be playing that and uh, Trump being a little more compassionate than I thought he would be. Let's go some other issues probably more than anybody else i picked up that joe biden this is before the 2020 election is weak and frail and a cognitive mess and i would say in the last three plus years he has deteriorated greatly i want to play a montage of the president take a look I guess I should clear my mind here a little bit and not say what I'm really thinking. There's some movement. There's been a response from the, uh, the, the there's been a response from the opposition. But um, it, it, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas. I think that. Uh, As you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate. When I said, when I we pushed all these programs, I said, I'm going to be a president for everybody, whether you live in a red state or a green state. Red state, green state, and President El Sisi of Mexico. I would be Egypt the last time I checked. Mr. President, um, what is your reaction to that? 86% of the American people believe he is too old to take on what is the hardest job in the world? Well, I hate to hear when, I, when they use the word old because I don't believe it's old. I know people that are 87, 88. I know people that are 90 in the 90s. I know people 99. I mean, Bernie Marcus, as an example, they're, he's 95. There are people that are just as sharp, it seems to me, just as sharp as they ever were. It, there's something, I guess, wrong. I don't want to, you know, I feel I'm at a conflict when you ask me that question because we're opponents, and I don't know, it's a, it's a tough question to answer. Uh, it's easy, the answer, but I don't like doing it. He's got some difficulty, but it's not the age, because I know a lot of people that are much older than him that are 100% sharp, and I think most people agree with that. I don't believe he'd be capable of sitting down to do an interview like this. It'd be impi when I, don't I believe debated he could do Gavin this Newsom, I said, your problem is the guy that you are bragging about yeah. could not have this exchange. Yeah, he could not do this interview. He couldn't do an interview where you ask even a few questions. And I said this morning, I say it loud and clear, you should take a cognitive test, a president should take a cognitive. Now, they say that's uh, unconstitutional. For whatever reason, it's unconstitutional. But I took two of them, and I aced both of them, I'm very proud to say, meaning I got it all right. Ronnie and they're Jackson. not that, they're not, Ronnie Jackson did one. They're not that easy. You know, they, they show you the first ones are pretty easy. And then you get up, you get into the middle category, then you get to the end questions, and very few people could answer those questions. They're, very, they're actually tough. very tough. I've seen the test. But, but I think it's important that there be some form. We have this man negotiating nuclear weapons with Putin and with uh, President Xi, and he has no idea what's going on, and he can't find his way off a, a platform when he's speaking. You have five stairs, and he ends up walking into a wall. And whenever I imitate him, they say, Trump had a hard time getting off a platform. I do, every once in a while, I'll do things out of sarcasm because I love sarcasm, but politically it never works because they always turn it around on you. But I'll tell you what, uh, it's not an age thing, but something's going on and we can't take a chance. This is the most dangerous time in the history of war. We have an incompetent president. Now, I used to treat him, and you know that I called you. I said, you should take it easy on him. By the I way, used to call you. This is a true story. You thought I was being too hard on him and I was making too light of it. He told me it was very interesting, very interesting to see uh, Trump taking that approach, because here's the thing. 
Trump isn't that much um, younger than Biden, right? I think he's younger to, uh, than him by three years. But he's sitting with Sean Hannity. Sean Hannity is not about to press Donald Trump. I mean, let's let's face it. You know what I mean? I, I can be honest about this. We know Sean Hannity. He's he's not he's not going to push Trump. He's not going to bring any real negativity to Trump. I think the most negative thing that he asked him is how much money do you stand to make off of Truth Social? And if it's really four billion dollars that you're about to make, which is wild. I didn't know that. And, you know, Trump kind of dodged the question. He was like, nah, it's not about how much I'm going to make. I own something that's doing really well, and it's the voice of America. So he kind of skirted the question, but that's it. That was the most pressure that Sean Hannity is going to put on, on Trump. And I say that to say he could have easily just went into how old Biden is. He could have easily done that. And Sean Hannity would have just nodded and been like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Definitely. But he chose to be like, it's not age. It's not age. Something's going on. He needs to take a cognitive test. It's very... You know, he still made fun of him a little bit. It's Trump. You know what I mean? He's not going to he's not going to let him get off scot free, but a little more compassionate than I'm used to uh, seeing him in regards to Biden. Usually it's uh, gloves off ever since the indictments came through. So very interesting to see. Very noble of him. And I just want to say really quick back to the Joe Rogan uh, clip. One of the things Joe Rogan said I forgot to touch on is RFK versus Trump. RFK wins that debate. I do not think that at all. There is no, I don't think that RFK would be able to win that debate. Now, it's not that RFK is not intelligent. It's that most people underestimate Trump's intelligence in regards to running the country. There are certain things that RFK wants to do, and he could explain those things really well. There's certain things Trump wants to do and has done and knows will work. And that's a whole different ballgame. So I think if those two actually debated on important topics, border co control, things of that nature, I think what would actually happen in that debate is RFK would show himself to be a Democrat and that would throw a lot of people off. A lot of people who look at him right now as like the anti-establishment guy, they would be very thrown off by what they would hear and see him do. Because when he gets into a point of talking about government and what he would do and what he would allow... There are some things, I mean, guys in the comments were talking about his uh, stance on gun control and how wild that was. Um, talking about if there was a consensus, he'd be willing to confiscate people's guns. <sighs> it's like you you, you, ha you have that happen long enough in a debate, long form debate. He's going to lose. Trump already knows what to say. Trump already knows what to do. There's a reason that he's just sweeping right now. He won Missouri and everything. There's a reason that's happening. And un, like a lot of people don't think, they think he's just flash and bravado and just saying things. But when you really get down to what he would do about certain things, he has, he has spoken about more and a more clearer path than RFK has. RFK has brought up some things. You know, he's brought up BlackRock, uh, buying up all the residential houses and what that looks like and how he would stop that and how he would enable um, young people to actually buy houses and be able to. And that's great. But if you got to him about border control, I haven't heard him talk much about border control. I haven't heard him talk much about what needs to happen there. But you know what Trump's stand is. All the things that are at the top of people's minds Trump is going to handle. He's been talking about handling it. And I'll just go to real quick, right before I show this clip, let me just jump over here. Because, uh, you know, Biden and Trump, they both visit the border. We're going to get into that in a second. But the way that Trump said he would handle Ukraine and Russia, he talked about Putin, talked about Putin being smart, talked about knowing the guy, talked about Zelensky talked about Zelensky being smart, talked about knowing them both, being able to talk this over. When RFK was asked about um, Putin, he went with the Democratic talking point, and he called Putin a monster, a thug, all sorts of names. And then he's going to have to sit and negotiate with that man. It's not going to go over well. 
if if Vladimir Putin knew that Tucker Carlson applied to the CIA, which is like an obscure fact that like I know, but why would Putin know? Then he's going to know that RFK called him a monster and a thug. It's not going to go over well. He's, he hasn't positioned himself well. He's a great guy, but he has not positioned himself well to be president or win a debate. Let's get into this. Biden, Trump, both at the border, both giving very different feels in their visit to the border. Let's go. Biden and former President Donald Trump will both make an appearance at the U.S.-Mexico border tomorrow. President Biden will be in Brownsville, Texas. Mr. Trump will be in Eagle Pass, Texas. These trips come as new data shows that the Tucson port of entry is one of the busiest right now in the country, while crossings in the Lone Star State have dropped. Fox 10's Lindsay Regis is here with reaction from a border county sheriff. Lindsay. John and Ellen, this will be President Biden's second visit to the border as president, but he has yet to visit border cities in Arizona. Cochise County Sheriff Mark Daniels reached out to the White House last year to get President Biden to the border, but his request has gone unanswered. Where have you been? This is a national discussion is a national challenge throughout the country. Cochise County Sheriff Mark Daniels calling the border crisis a slippery slope. Meanwhile, both presidential candidates will be at the U.S.-Mexico border on Thursday to try to turn the nation's broken immigration system to their political advantage. Is an election year? Is that why you're coming? Is because Trump's coming? I don't know, but our sitting president should be working hand in hand and prioritizing this with us. That would be my question to the president. Where you been? Regardless of reason, Daniels says he appreciates when they come to the border to see the reality and meet with local leaders. Get the politics out of it, get the re-election thoughts out of it, and let's do our oath and fix this border and secure this country. The sector with the highest number of migrant crossings is in Arizona. According to federal government statistics, Border Patrol recorded more than 250,000 migrant apprehensions in the Tucson sector from October to January. This is the most migrant crossings the Arizona border has seen. The state has also had the largest increase in encounters compared to the same time last year. From May 8th, of uh, 2023 till just recent, uh, just within the last few days, we've had 715 buses take street releases out of Cochise County that had been transported here, not that they came across the border here, but transported here from other parts of the border and taken to NGOs in Pima County and beyond. That equates to 37,000 migrant street releases in Cochise County. The White House wow wow see that's the thing when it comes to uh, this whole border thing i wish that biden had to meet with a guy like that because you do have to answer that question and why not i mean we all know why not answer that question it would be difficult for him i'm gonna take a compassionate role like trump it would be difficult for him to answer that question for more than one reason but he should have to stand in front of guys like that that guy's been trying to get him to the border and only now as Trump is going, do you decide to go? And then, you know, I'll let you guys decide. But like from what I'm breaking down, it's like it's it's like a very uh, kid glove type of way of handling Biden. He's only meeting with certain people. They're just going to stand there and listen to him. They're going to laugh at his jokes. It's not the actual people who are upset with him. Those people get pushed aside. It's not the people who want to question him. In fact, you don't get to ask him any questions. You get to tell him certain things and that's it. And then he gets to talk and then you don't get to say anything and he leaves. And it's like, I don't know. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Uh, let's move on here. Just a little more information. I just want to give you guys some context on what's going on. Hey, Fox News anchor Shannon Bream with Fox News Sunday joins me now. Good morning to you. Good to see you, Brandon. All right, so the differences between President Biden and former President Trump really showed yesterday in their vastly different approaches to the border crisis. Yeah, President Biden says they need more money. He needs Congress to pass sweeping legislation that would help him to fund more border agents, more immigration judges. Here's the thing. They both on both sides admit that there is a massive problem at the border, but they don't agree on how to solve it. President Trump will point back to what he did during his time. A number of executive orders the remain in Mexico policy. Now, some of that got caught up in the courts for years and that made it less effective. But he points to the numbers and says, listen, you undid a lot of my stuff on day one. And 
and look at the explosion that we've had in the three years since. So when President Biden said yesterday, I'm asking President Trump, come work with me, let's solve this together, you can imagine there's plenty of skepticism on the other side of the aisle. All right, so what's next here? Does President Biden issue uh, or even redact what he did on day one? Could Congress step in at this point? I mean, we are in March now. Mm -hmm. Election day is eight months away. Yeah, so you know the Senate deal fell apart. There is still a bipartisan deal that's working in the House, whether they can get something done there. It's not going to be a huge, massive overhaul to the immigration system, but it may put some things in place that would stem the current flow in some ways. It's still doubtful. So there are murmurings that the White House is getting more serious about the president potentially taking executive action. He's got a ton of pressure from progressives in the far left of his party saying, no, no, no. What we're hearing is some of the stuff that President Trump was doing. You blasted that. You called it cruel. We are openly going to oppose you if you even think about taking any of those specific actions. All right. Uh, no doubt you'll be addressing this Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. That's wild. That's absolutely wild. And, you know, it just goes right back. And I'm going to let you guys hear what Biden has to say, of course. You know, I mean, he is the president of the United States, so you do want to hear what he has to say. But it, what she said is correct. He's looking for more money. Um, Trump is just pretty much congratulating uh, Greg Abbott because that, that if you're going to go to the border, that's who you go and see. You go and see the guy who has just made a tremendous effort and is actually stopping things. And in Biden's case, if you oppose what he's doing, then that's the person you go and work with. It's very interesting. I'm going to bring up some points as we go on. I'm going to bring up just a little bit more for context here. And then we're going to move on to a Trump speech, Biden's speech. Brownsville Station of the Customs and Border Protection. The president is en route to this facility for a briefing from local officials. And then we'll address uh, the assembled here, a collection of statewide and local uh, elected officials, uh, CBP agents and others uh, from the community. He was at the border a little while ago, uh, meeting with some CBP agents, uh, seeing their equipment, getting a sense of things there down on the Rio Grande. Well, about 325 miles away, roughly the distance between Boston and Philadelphia or Los Angeles and San Jose, to give you a sense of the, the, the vastness of the U.S.-Mexico border across this Lone Star State, former President Trump, uh, his meeting with Governor Greg Abbott, arguably these days the biggest Republican opponent of the president's immigration policy, at least active Republican or Republican in office, uh, whose state has been fighting the federal government over who exactly should be handling apprehensions of those illegally crossing the border. Uh, Trump is in Eagle Pass visiting uh, what's called uh, well, Shelby Park, this park that's become sort of the flashpoint between the state and federal uh, agencies down there that argue and, and fight in court over who exactly has control of the border. Uh, and they will be spending a good chunk Ladies of the afternoon together. We, ask that you please we take are your seats. Uh, the program will awaiting a momentarily. program to begin here in just a few minutes. Uh, again, first, the president is, is set to get an operational briefing from local CBP officials alongside his Homeland Security Secretary, who, of course, also is a big Republican target these days, having recently been impeached by the Republican-led House of Representatives for his oversight of immigration policy, uh, awaiting a trial date, if you will, in the Senate, whether or not they actually take up his impeachment charges remains to be seen, Errol. All right, that announcement, Ed, suggests we need to let you go momentarily. So let me see if I can squeeze in this question and you can, you know, jump and sit down when you have to. We've because got time. Go ahead. We've got this fresh CBS News polling, or at least a polling from January, which shows the stark divide between Republicans and Democrats on how they view the issue of border security. And if we kind of extrapolate some of these numbers, uh, we know that uh, immigration and the border seeming to be the second most important factor uh, or problem facing the country after inflation. But when you look into yep. what Democrats and Republicans said, uh, some 64% of Democrats said, well, look, most people crossing the border are looking for jobs. But on the Republican side, some 46% said most are crossing the border looking for handouts. How does that color how each side is trying to solve what appears to be a, a high issue of national importance? It's why we have an impasse in the Democratic-controlled Senate and the Republican-controlled House right now over not only how to handle this issue, despite the... I just wanted you guys to hear that number mostly. That's very interesting. I mean, obviously, that's why there's a clear um, split between the two parties. I mean, that and other reasons, of course. You know, one is, a, you know, captured cabal, and the other is a bunch of uh, patriots. Uh, <laughs> I'm not biased. Am I, does that sound biased? I'm not biased. 
Uh, <laughs> but honestly, 64% think that they're there for jobs. 46% Republicans think they're there for handouts. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it could be tr both can be true. I think both are true. I think there was a first wave of people who could be anybody because when you don't know who the people are, they could be anybody. And there could be some people looking for jobs. But once you get over there and they give you money and they give you a phone and they give you a hotel room and your food is just brought to you, you probably get on the phone and say, hey, you should come. And they're like, oh, I don't want job. I don't want to work hard. Hey, yeah, no, no, it's not like that. Like we'll get jobs eventually, but it's not like that for right now. They're just, they just give us everything. You should get over here. This is the way I went. That's kind of what's happening. So I'm sure some people want jobs, but once you get, it's like, it's like somebody who, you know, gets on welfare. It's like, at first you want a job, but then all of a sudden you get comfortable in welfare and then you kind of stay on welfare. It's kind of the same thing that's going to go on with these people. It's like, how long can I just have this hotel room? Are they ever going to tell me that I have to go and find an apartment and work? Are they ever going to tell me that? No? Okay. How much easier is... Imagine you come from Venezuela where you're working so hard and then you get, you get to America and all of a sudden they're just like, yeah, you don't... Yeah, you can't really work. And you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Am I going to be homeless? And they're like, and there's this hotel. So you're going to stay in there. You're on the fourth floor. Um, and we'll bring you breakfast soon. You'd be like, what? <laughs> I'm never going back ever. You know, and then worst case scenario, I have to work like I planned on working to begin with. I don't know. I, th I think both can be true. I think uh, some people, are, they're, they're people, right? I mean, you don't look at immigrants. You can't look at immigrants like everybody's an angel. I mean, we've seen there's crime, there's this, there's that. There's guys, that, I'm sure there's guys that want to work. I'm sure some guys come over and they even have a family back home. But there's a lot that don't. It's just, both can be true at the same time. I don't know. I don't know. And it's, and it's, it's so hard to know because you don't know who anybody is. <laughs> that, that's, that's step one. If we really knew who these people were and they really had their actual IDs to the actual countries of their origin, then it would be a whole different ball game. You'd understand way more about what's going on, but they're able to just rip up their passports and still walk into the country. So that makes it pretty difficult. Um, so yeah, both of them visit the border. There's a whole lot going on right now. Let's move on. This is uh, President Trump speaking alongside of Greg Abbott, and uh, let's go. But Texas is very secure and it's going to be even more secure by the time you finish, which will be soon. And I just want to thank some friends of mine. Brandon Judd has been a friend from day one. He knew what we were all about and uh, knew what we were saying and doing, and I think we were ahead of our time. And uh, General Thomas Sulzer was uh, somebody that was always right there and understands this uh, Texas military department about as well as you could have. I think he understands war, because that's what you're in. You're in a war. And William Mike Gorby, you know who he is, and he's been fantastic. It's just an incredible group that you've put together, fortunately. Uh, I might ask uh, Brandon to say a couple of words, because right at the beginning, we were, uh, we were into it. We saw what was happening, and the governor was there, and then he really, he really stepped it up. It's been amazing. Uh, I came when I was lucky enough to receive his endorsement. I endorsed him also and uh, very proudly endorsed him. And uh, a lot of things have happened in the last little while. But this is an incredible operation. Uh, Brandon, would you like to say a couple of words, please? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. President, thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, I, wa I want you to know your agents, my agents, they're mad as hell, absolutely mad that President Biden went to Brownsville, Texas, Rather than going to Arizona, rather than going to San Diego, California, rather than coming to Eagle Pass, Texas, which has been the epicenter, what President Trump has seen right here is he's seen how his policies have worked, but he's also seen how he can expand upon those policies once he takes goes back into the White House. He has seen how Governor Abbott has been able to use his policies to secure this specific area, the epicenter of the last two years of the illegal border crisis that we have had to endure. And your agents, President, they are pissed. Border Patrol agents are upset that we cannot get the proper policy that is necessary to protect human life, 
to protect American citizens, to protect the people that are crossing the border illegally, we want to protect them as well. And we can't do that because President Biden's policies continue to invite people to cross here. Thank goodness we have a governor like Governor Abbott. Thank goodness we have somebody that's willing to run for President of the United States, forgo everything else that he's been doing to serve the American people. President, thank you. The uh, reports have come out, and we've been covering them, and everybody's been. And I spoke to the parents of an incredible young lady, and you you saw her the other day. You saw what happened the other day in Georgia. And the parents are devastated. They're incredible people. But this is a Joe Biden invasion. This is a Biden invasion over the past three years. I call him Crooked Joe because he's crooked. He's a terrible president, the worst president our country's ever had. Uh, probably the most incompetent president we've ever had. But it's uh, allowing thousands and thousands of people to come in from China, Iran, Yemen, the Congo, Syria, and a lot of other nations. Many nations are not very friendly to us. He's transported the entire columns of uh, fighting-aged men, and they're all at a certain age. And you look at them, and they say, they're they look like warriors to me. Something's going on that's bad. Now the United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. It's migrant crime. We call it Biden migrant crime, but that's a little bit long. So we'll just leave it. But every time you hear the term migrant crime, you know where that comes from, allowing thousands and thousands and actually millions and millions of people to come. Could be 15 million, could be 18 million by the time he uh, gets out of office, because hopefully the biggest risk we have is nine months. That's a long time. Right. A lot of bad things can happen. As I always say in speeches and rallies, it's if you take the 10 worst presidents in the history of our country, and you added them all up, all of the problems, all of the lousy jobs they've done, you can add them all up. It's not as bad as this one man has done for our country. What he's done to our country is he's destroying our country. Uh, we were just talking before. We were, the general was saying, I can't believe, he can't believe what's happening. He can't believe it's so sad. Last year, almost half. Uh, it's, a, it's a long speech. It's about 40, uh, 42 minutes that he, uh, he goes on. And yeah, I just wanted to play that part because, uh, yeah. It's it's interesting what that gentleman said. The gentleman that's standing beside him, uh, the bald gentleman there, uh, Brandon Judd. Um, yeah, why? I said it at the beginning. Why not visit Eagle Pass? Why not go to where the heart of everything is? And this is the thing. And I'll let you decide. I'm going to show uh, Biden speaking now. But it's like, man, you you were looking for more of a photo op. You were looking to sell your bill more than you were looking to actually get on the ground and talk with the people who are going through a lit a war. I've heard too much about what Tim Kennedy talks about with the cartels and what's happening to the people who are trying to cross and what the border patrol is going through. And it, it is an actual war. It is a war on cartel drugs. It's it's trafficking. It's getting so, human trafficking. It's getting so bad. And you're you're what you're trying to do, President Biden, I mean, is you're trying to rally up somebody to pa help you pass this bill so you could have $20 billion go to the border because that's the only way to secure it. And that's not true. That's not true. He has the ability. You know, ha Speaker of the House, head the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson said right away when Biden's like, you got to sign this bill for me to secure the border. He's like, no, you have the power right now. So when he goes to the border, he doesn't go to the heart of it. Trump goes to the heart of it. It's This is just a photo op. It's all he's trying to do right now. And I had a bunch of clips I was going to show you in regards to Biden and what's he, what he's doing when he's there. I mean, I'll just, I'll just jump real quick. I mean, like, he's literally just standing with people. They're just explaining things to him on, on Bristol boards. Like, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. They're not even mic'd up properly, so you can't even hear them. It's like, what is this? So these are individuals that have been encountered by Border Patrol. They claim to fear, and now they go before an asylum officer who interviews them and makes those decisions. Um, we do have 
hundreds of very well-trained and dedicated officers like Katisha Jackson, um, but it's simply not enough. So we've tried to be very creative uh, to better help support the mission since May 12th. So for example, we've leveraged IT technology to create efficiencies, we've leveraged overtime, we've even trained other volunteers from across USCIS to get them trained and able to do this work and support it. Um, we've been very fortunate to be able to complete the highest number of credible fear completions ever in history because of the why isn't he talking that gentleman that Trump is standing next to that gentleman's a high ranking person. I, I want to say he's the president of the, the National Border Council. I believe that's his title. Maybe Border Patrol Council. I'm not 100 percent, but he's the president. He's a high ranking person. These are high ranking people that he could be talking to. He could have met there. He could have went there when Trump was there and said, listen, I want to get. Listen, I like what they've done here, but I want things done differently. I want them done more compassionately. And honestly, you're not president right now, and I am. So I actually want these guys time, and I hope you guys are willing to take my request. I want to talk to you guys right now. He could have done that. Could have done that. There's more reasons than one that he actually couldn't have done that. That's, a, that's me speaking. I got super cognitive abilities myself. Him, not so much. I'm trying to be more compassionate, like Trump. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's just silly. But uh, let's 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 move back. What minute did I have it at? Timestamp. If you do see this speech, timestamp is twenty eight minutes when Biden starts talking here. So we're standing with everyone, everyone affected by these wildfires. I'm going to continue to help you respond and recover. Now, turning to the purpose of my visit, I want to thank Congressman Gonzalez. We're, there you are, pal. I, th I, thank him. I thank him for the passport into his district, but uh, he's been a great partner. I also want to thank Mayor, 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 Mayor Cowan for his partnership, and I want to thank County Judge Trevino I, uh, for over 30 and over 30 local officials who've joined us here today. No one, no one works harder for a safe, secure border than all of you. And Secretary Mayorkas has joined us today, and he's joined by seven mayors in cities and towns across South Texas. Four county judges here from across the state. I told the county judge that I used to be a county official. It's the hardest job in American politics. You know why? They think you can do everything and you don't have the budget. So anyway. <laughs> and the two leaders from the Texas legislature, State House Leader Trey is here, Trey Martinez Fisher, and the State Senate Leader Carol Alvadero. Uh, and uh, look, uh, and all the other local officials that are here today, I want to say thanks. Folks, it's real simple. It's time to act. It's long past time to act. I just received a briefing from the Border Patrol at the border, as well as immigration and enforcement, asylum officers, and they're all doing incredible work under really tough conditions, really tough conditions. They told me what, they, what, what you already know and we already know. They desperately need more resources. Say it again, they desperately need more resources. They need more agents, more officers, more judges, more equipment in order to secure our border. Folks, it's time for us to move on this. We can't wait any longer. Folks, on my first day as president, I introduced a bill I sent to Congress, a comprehensive plan to fix the broken immigration system and to secure the border. But no action was taken. Then months ago, my team began a serious negotiation in a bipartisan group of senators Democrat leading conservative Republicans and de progressive Democrats. And it resulted in a compromise bill. It's the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen in this country. It's pretty basic. With this deal, we could hire 1,500 additional border security agents, 1,500 additional officer and officers, and between ports of entry. For the last four years, staffing has been roughly that, flat, just flat. Agents working overtime, spending long hours patrolling the border, making major sacrifices. And I know it takes a big toll on them and their families. That's why in December I signed a bill, finally getting Border Patrol agents, what I've been pushed by and reminded by the congressman, overtime pay they deserve. And finally getting overtime pay. I, I mean, it's ridiculous it took this long. It was a long past time, and I was proud to do it. But we need to do more. It's time to step up. It's time to step up, provide them with significantly more personnel and capability. 
We also need more immigration judges to help handle the backlog. There are two million cases, backlog of two million cases. This bipartisan deal would provide funding for 100 more immigration judges immediately. It would also establish new, efficient, and fair process for the government to consider asylum claims for those arriving on our border. Today, the process to get a decision on an asylum claim takes five to seven years. Now, you all know it down here, but the people around the country don't understand it. It's far too long. You come in, you say, you say I have a credible fear, and, and we've changed that standard to make it hard. We want to change make it harder. And what happens? You say, well, okay, you can come in the country, but come back in five to seven years, maybe as many as eight years, and you'll get a hearing from before a judge to determine whether you can stay. This will encourage more people. This encourages more people to come to the country. <clears throat> if they get by the first, say they got another five, seven, eight years before they have to do anything because they know they cannot handle the caseloads quickly. Ah, oh, man. So, like I said, and, you know, I wanted to play that. I know it might have seemed a bit long for anybody. Some people might have tuned out, but he is the president. And I, I, I do want to, you know, again, it's a, it's a very long speech. His speech is about 49 minutes. Um, but I just wanted to play a little snippet. In my mind, he's just trying to position himself to sell that bill. And he doesn't have to do that. He's talking about these things like this is what it takes to secure the border. He has a governor who shows him what Greg Abbott got it where there was thousands of people getting through a day he got it down from 10 to three people a day would get through there's a governor that's already shown you the way why not have all the other governors all along the border instruct them to do the exact same thing the the shipping containers the um the um bar the the, the barbed wire do that get the numbers down and then worry about this. See, here's the thing. He's not, it's like he's not even worried about the flow of people. He's just worried about like, oh, we need fentanyl detectors. It's like there's, there's no, there's no cartel people walking through your fentanyl detector. Yes, you may be able to detect some people that are in a shipping cargo van and things of that nature because it's not just to de detect fentanyl. It's, it's almost like an x-ray machine that he's talking about, but they position it as um, a fentanyl detector because they feel like that's the most important thing to detect, but it detects all sorts of things, this technology. And yeah, that's important, definitely, but you can stop the flow. If you stop the flow, then all of a sudden that machine that he's talking about becomes really important because those are only going through legal ports of entry. Now, all of a sudden you have that and you have the flow stopped. Well, then they have to bring it through that port. Now, all of a sudden your machine makes sense. While everything's wide open, that machine doesn't make any sense. That's like having a store that has those two things that you walk through that are metal detectors, but the entire store is just wide open. There's no walls, but the two things are here. It's like, oh, well, Nobody's going to get out of here with anything. It's like, what are you talking? They just walk around the back. What are you saying right now? Again, I just think he's trying to position it so he can get this bill done. I don't know how much he's actually trying to get. Maybe it's the 20 billion that he presented at first when it was all wrapped up with Ukraine and Israel money. Maybe it's now just solely that and he's trying to position that. But he has the power right now to stop it. And he just refuses. He refuses. It's like, you got to give, you got to, you got to, you got to grant me this money. Then I'll handle it. I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe it's more big guy trying to get some 10%. I don't know. I have no idea. It's just, it's very odd to me. Anyways, let's move on to some good news. He won Missouri. It's a Patriots. Over the past few weeks, we've been on a rocket to the Republican nomination. It's been a rocket. I didn't win Iowa. You won Iowa. We all won Iowa together in a record. We won it in a record double the previous record. That's not bad. New Hampshire in a record double the previous record. We actually got more votes than anybody in the history of the New Hampshire primary. That's pretty good. We just won Nevada and we got 98% of the votes. Sorry about the 2%. We had an off day. We were missing 2%. The Virgin Islands, we won unanimously. Thank you, Virgin Islands. Beautiful place. Go to the Virgin Islands sometime. And one week ago, we won South Carolina, beating a certain governor. 
by unprecedented numbers and getting double the number of votes of any previous candidate in the history of South Carolina. How about that? And as you know, today we have two contests. We have Missouri and we have the remainder of Michigan. And I will tell you in advance what just happened because we just found out as I was coming up, looks like we're winning 100% of both. 100%. One hundred percent. Can't we do better than that? And that adds on to last Tuesday's Michigan primary win, which was won with almost 77 percent of the vote, I think. Seventy-seven percent, something like that. Next up is Super Tuesday. That's on Tuesday, March 5th. That's in three days from now. And it's time for the great state of North Carolina, don't forget, don't forget, my granddaughter is named Carolina, okay? It's very important. We need each and every one of you to get the patriots from your family, your friends, everybody, get them out and turn them out to vote in record numbers because we have to show what's happening on November 5th. That's when we have to get the worst president in the history of our country the hell out of office. <laughs> Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen, wins Missouri. I figured I'd end it off on that positive note. Um, and yeah, you decide what you think Biden's actual intentions are, are with visiting the border. Um, Trump's seem a little more honest mainly because he's currently not president. So when he goes out there, it's kind of to show more support. When you are the president, even if he just went out to Eagle Pass, it would show support, even if he didn't agree. You could still say, great job on lowering the numbers so much. Like, fantastic, I don't think this is right, and I want this taken down, but you did a great job. Now, can we talk about doing it better? I don't know. I, I, I don't want to talk in circles here, but I wanted to end it off on that note, guys. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Other than that, I'm out.